Well, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is John Funk. I, uh, I used to be a sailor. Uh, in the uh, Navy, I served uh, 28 years. I was a helicopter pilot. Uh, for the first 20-odd uh, years of that, I had the good fortune to command the uh, USS Bonhomme Shard here in San Diego, uh, amphibious assault ship, um, with uh, 3,000 sailors and Marines on board uh, for a great adventure. So, retired from the Navy in uh, the summer of 2012 and got a job as a, I was the executive assistant to the Admiral at Spay War in San Diego for my last uh, my last Navy job after my command of my ship. And then I found, I found myself uh, getting a job there at Spay War as a government employee uh, for the first 14 months following my retirement from active duty. Um, in that process, I applied for probably six different federal jobs and was pretty proud of the fact that I got through the certification process on all of them. Um, and then I found myself on the hiring panel for several other federal jobs um, once I got that position there with the government. So a little bit about my background. Um, there's some credibility for I've been on both sides of the trying to get in and then trying to uh, seeing it from uh, the hiring board panel side um, on the government side as well. So I thought I'd share some of those insights with you today as well. Um, now I work for Easter Steel Southern California. Uh, that government position was not quite scratching my itch. Uh, and after a career worth of service, uh, I felt that I still needed to serve in a different capacity. Uh, so I found myself at Easter Steel Southern California. We just started the new military veterans service program. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end uh, because it's a service that's available to, to you all as well. Um, just to get an idea of the room, is, is everybody a veteran? Mm -hmm. Not enough? Okay. Just okay. Us. Everybody is a Master of Social Work candidate and potentially interested in a federal job. Right? Is that safe to say? Yes. All right. So, I don't know why you guys think I'm here today, but I think the reason I'm here today is what Maureen and I have worked out was that I would come talk about the federal job application process and I'd just give you some of my perspective. Is that what you guys are looking for? Okay, if you're looking for something else, I expect you to speak up, okay? Uh, I had an interesting event today. Marlene sent me her resume, and she also sent me a potential job that we would use as a case study. Uh, the irony is the job closed out yesterday. So when I went on this morning to the USA Jobs website to QA my presentation for today, I realized that everything that I was looking for was no longer there because the job had closed. So we're going to do a little bit of on the fly search for a job and kind of talk through that application. But then the slides that I've created go back to the original job that Marlene and I were looking at together along with the questionnaire. So stop me along the way. Uh, I, I, I could talk all day about this process, uh, but this is about what you guys are looking for. So, stop as we go. So first up, I've been thinking a lot about the Sochi Olympics. Did you guys watch any of it, or have you been too busy with school? Yeah, no. I watched it. Okay, were you aware that the Olympics were occurring? Yes. yes. Okay, all right, so we'll start there. So I was thinking, if you want to go be, if you want to win a gold medal in the Olympics, you don't want to just go participate, what, what do you need to do? Prepare. Prepare, Prepare. practice. Train. Try out. Try out. <laughs> How about before all that? Be an athlete. Be an athlete. What were you going to say, Mom? Some sort of skill. Have a skill. Like you have some sort of interest. Okay. Interest. Really research. What's that? I don't have a drive right away. I don't know that go in. Okay. Uh, you doing this all by yourself? I have like trainers. Trainer. Maybe somebody that's already been through it. Okay. Coach. Maybe a sponsor. So, you know that old joke, uh, this violinist shows up in New York City, he's walking around with his violin, and he says, hey, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And this guy says, yeah, the way you get to Carnegie Hall is you practice, practice, practice. That's, that's my 26-year-old daughter told me that you guys might accept that joke. So, 
<laughs> All right, so, so I think those are some of the elements that you have to have in play if you're going to go win an Olympic gold medal. There's a process. There is an understanding of the rules. Right? If you're going to go be a bobsledder, you, you probably need to know how to push and jump into a vehicle and then weigh a lot and let gravity do its thing. Right? But you need to have equipment. Uh, you, you, need, you need to know the rules so you can play within the rules and then push the rule boundaries. All those things I think are important if you want to, if you want to do well in a process that maybe you're not familiar with. So I wanted to use that as kind of the sound, the, the launching pad here for, boy, trying to apply for a federal job is difficult. It's, it, it's not for the, it's not for the lazy. Okay, I looked at this uh, handout that you have, that USA, oh my gosh, that thing is, uh, there's a lot of words there. Uh, so, we're going to talk about that today, and I'm going to show you some of the process, but stop me as we go. So when I think about this whole process, right, very similar to you want to win a gold medal by, and I'll, we'll call today getting a gold medal is getting a government job. Right? There's a lot of stability um, having a government job, uh, sort of, right? Last year I was furloughed, I was sequestered, um, and I was a little bit unpleased with the whole situation. Hence why I don't work for the federal government anymore. But I kind of done that for the first 28 years of my life, from the time I was 17 as a plebe at the Naval Academy. So I really hadn't known anything else. So, um, but there's the job search process, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. There's the apply online process. That's you. So those first two elements. That's that's all about you. The rest of this is stuff that you don't really have control of. So we're going to talk about why you don't have control over things and what do you do about that. So let's look at that. We're, we're going to talk today scoring your application based on the questionnaire self-assessment. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, good, good. Because that's a, Marlene and I had an interesting little interaction when she said, oh, here's a job that I might be interested in. Uh, and when I pushed back and said, hey, gosh, I can't, I can't seem to get to the link of the questionnaire, um, Marlene's response was, uh, what questionnaire? That, I love that. That was a good trading point because that's one of the most essential elements for you securing, or let's not, let's just say being competitive for a government job. There's a self score. We're going to talk about these things. You go to the questionnaire and you evaluate yourself. And we're, going to, we're going to look at one of those today. Uh, these slides, Marlene's got my brief, so I'm just, all this will be available to you. So. Uh, let's, let's, let's dig a little deeper. <coughs> you submit your application. And today we're going to talk about all that stuff that goes into submitting the application when you hit submit. And when you hit submit, there's some HR folks that are going to be involved in the process. Please come on in. Uh, my youngest son goes to Stanford, so I was going to wear a Stanford shirt today, but then I thought, oh, wow, well, that's, that would really not be cool. So. I'll see if I can get you a USC shirt. That's okay. I'm, so fight on will be the theme of fight on to get through the federal application process. Okay, that's where we'll fight on. That's okay. Gang warfare, is that what you're yeah. interested in? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> I, mean, I, love, I love you guys too. <laughs> so I submit this federal application. And then it goes, and, and I score myself on this self evaluation. And there's going to be criteria. I don't know anything about this topic, to I am an expert, and everybody comes to me because I'm the expert. And I'm going to grade myself on that process. Nobody's going to do a quality check before I can submit. But then when I grade it, some HR folks are going to review that, and they're going to validate my score. Now, how do they know if I'm an expert or if I don't know anything? It's all about the words that I use in my resume and how I, how I answer the questions, my short answers, if they ask for short answers, or does my resume have supporting experience based on how I graded myself? So I'm an HR, prof no, we're going to take this away. I'm an HR professional, 
and I'm going to grade your questionnaire. I don't know anything about this billet, this position that you're applying for. I'm not an expert. I didn't write the position description. All I know is somebody said, hey, check the scores of all of these USC cats that just applied for this job. So I read the position description and the requirements, and then I read your resume and self-evaluation, and I see if they align. It's all about the words you choose. Right? So, grad school students should say that I probably need to dissect that questionnaire and make sure every area that they're asking for certain areas of expertise that I've got supporting documentation in my resume that substantiates that. So, well, we're going to talk more about this. Uh, everybody's aware, right? Resumes, pretty, keep it pretty brief, right? Very streamlined. One page, two pages max. You guys are grad school students, so you've got a lot more education. Right. Push all that aside. If you're looking for streamlined, very narrowly focused, one to two pages for a federal employment, don't even bother hitting the submit because you're not going to be considered. Okay? You have to have, take all that stuff that said, I need to be streamlined and think, boy, I need to plump up my resume that says everything they're looking for, I better have some experience and, and I better demonstrate where I have experience. Okay? Because you got to get through the HR folks. Right? They're not, they're not mental health experts. They're not vocational rehab specialists. They, they don't know what you're applying for. They just know, here are the words, here's what you said. Okay? That's an important point. We're going to keep going back to that. Now, the rest of this process then. So, first off, i got to get through the HR folks, and they got to say, hey, this, this guy's legit. His resume supports what his grades are. If I get through that process, I make something that they call the certification. So I am certified, which means I am a valid candidate. So now this pile of certified records gets taken to the people that are going to hire you. So the actual, the, the, the folks that you're going to work for. It, it could be the head, it could be the deputy um, of that organization. He may be running the interview panel, the selection panel. So that panel is going to take all those records. And they're going to say, well, gosh, we've got this spectrum of students that are looking for this job. What kind of grading criteria do we want to have? What do we think are the most important elements? Their answer to that question, what are the most important elements, should be a direct reflection of what the duties and responsibilities were defined on when you applied for the job. They ought to be lined up. So please think the duties are listed in priority order. So when you see those duties, you should think about the first three to five duties that are defined are the most significant responsibilities that you'll have to perform. That's how you should tailor your resume to reflect that. Okay? So they're going to come up with this criteria. Then generally what they do is everybody goes off on their own and they quietly score out how they're going to do that. And the scores could vary. You know, a, a, it could be a, a one to three, it could be a one to five, whatever that is. But it may say, we really want to talk with this person. Um, this person maybe we want to talk to, or this person definitely does not need to be in the mix. So they're going to score that, then they're going to come together, and they're going to say, how do those grades fall out? Um, is, there, is there one that's substantial? And then maybe there's another three or four that are kind of like just a step below that. Well, let's look at all five of those people, and that's who we're actually going to do an interview with. So right, there's all these hurdles you have to get through. You can't control anything past when you hit apply and submit your submit your application. Right? You can't control the rest of this. All you can do is find the best way to tell your story. To make that to make them say that why you should be the most competitive person for that particular position. Okay? Uh, one other thing, let me tell you about the interviews and the offer. I'm not going to dig into that today. This isn't a how to conduct an interview. You're grad school students and professional and young people. You know how to handle yourselves. But let me tell you, when it comes time for an offer from the federal government, you don't have to just take what they're, you're given. You can, you can negotiate. So feel free to negotiate. Uh, I got this federal job. Uh, this, uh, you know, in the, the government world, there's 
in the military ranks, we have general officers and flag officers, right? Admirals and generals. Uh, in the civilian equivalent of that, they're called uh, senior executive service members, SESs. So this SES, so like a civilian admiral equivalent, called me and said, hey John, here's, here's the position and here's what the compensation would be. And I had known him when I was on active duty and I said, wow, you're, I feel like you're really kind of lowballing me here. I mean, I, I know exactly what you're asking for me to do in this job. If, if you're looking for a guy that's going to punch a clock and work kind of a nine to five job, then I think that's an appropriate salary range. But if you're, if you're looking for weekends, 4 a.m. VTCs with the Pentagon out from, you know, from San Diego, all this travel, hey, there's a compensation that's associated with that. And I think he was a little bit surprised. And I think the HR people were kind of surprised. And I, but I had had some other offers, so I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play hardball with it. So we met in the middle. So I, I share that with you and that you don't have to just take what, what's offered. Because every federal job has a range in salaries. And we'll see that when we look at an app and when we look at a job today. And a lot of it's based on your experience and background. So, so just something to file away with the offer. Today we're going to focus on the apply online part. That's what we're really going to focus on. All right. So when you apply for a job, do you know how to do you know how to search for jobs in USA Jobs? Right. We'll talk about that a little bit today, just a little bit. Marlene asked. Well, she was looking for somebody that was really a USA Jobs expert. I would say I am a USA Jobs brute force executor, okay? <laughs> I figure it out and struggle and curse and, uh, and when I find an application, I copy it all and then I stuff it in a Word document so if I can't find it again, at least I have it somewhere. Thank goodness I did that because the job that I worked on that I bring, made this whole brief on disappeared. But I had done what I always did. I copied it all and stuffed it in a Word document so I was able to kind of create it. So, so, so when you apply for a job, uh, did, did most of you guys have jobs before you came to grad school? I mean, mil military folks did, but maybe right, right from undergrad to graduate school? Okay, so when you think about a job, I really would encourage you to think about something that you really want to do. And, and there's a lot of criteria for that, for that why would you want to do a job? Location, the job, the money. Those three criteria, I think, are the main criteria. Um, you got to decide what's best for you. For me, the John Funk family, uh, the Navy brought us here to San Diego, we decided we were not leaving. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I are both from Philadelphia. I went to the Naval Academy, she went to Penn. We had spent a lot of our whole you know, young, young lives growing up on the East Coast. We were not going back to Philadelphia. I love the place. I love going back to visit, not going back to finish up. I have four children. The, the youngest who's at Stanford now, was, we would have had to have moved in between high school for our fourth child, and we were not going to do that one more time. Kind of worked out. Kid's doing okay for himself. Uh, we'll all collectively be working for him someday, um, I think. But, we made a decision when I retired that was, it was based on location. We were gonna stay in San Diego. We were not, we moved 13 times in my first 24 years on active duty. We were not picking up and moving again. Finally bought a house, uh, well our fourth house and decided this was where we were gonna stay. So when I said, we're gonna work in San Diego, I really narrowed that aperture down, right? Here was a guy, helicopter pilot, ship captain, Navy, Navy captain retiring, a lot of, Federal opportunity, a lot of defense opportunity. Not really interested. Interested in staying in San Diego. That's what the family wanted to do, and that was my number one priority. So I made some job position um, decisions and some money decisions based on that criteria. Think about that. What's really important to you? So, I, and I don't think most people really want to have that talk with you. Um, right. So that's kind of your head, your heart. Your seat of the pants all kind of working together there to figure it out. But then also think about what are you qualified to do? There may be the prime job out there, but you just don't have the experience for it yet. That's a good time to talk with your fellow social workers, uh, educators, and professionals and say, I want to get here. What do I need to do to get there? I, I never, when I grew up in the Navy, I never wanted to go be a ship captain, um, but I 
but I sort of did all the jobs that led me there because it gave me that breadth of experience. As a non as a non ship driver, my whole career, I was just some knucklehead helicopter pilot. I didn't run an engineering plant. I didn't run a, a 400 bed hospital before. Um, I hadn't done all small boat operations, but I had experience that led me to there. So you have to think about that uh, ultimately for you. If you want to be the Surgeon General someday, if you want to health and human services, whatever you think your ultimate goal may be, you got to think about those intermediate steps to get there. So, and then research these jobs. Just because it's a government job doesn't mean you can't reach out and talk to people. Ironically, all the social work jobs that I've been uh, noodling with on USA Jobs, they all have a point of contact, an email and a phone number. Use that. If you can, I think what we do at Easter Seals, frankly, is um, we help veterans walk through the whole employment process, but what we really do is we link them into the network that we have access to. And I'm not afraid to pick up the phone and say, hey, wow, I met this great gal at USC, Marlene. She's graduating in May. Boy, I'd really love to send her over to just have an, an informational interview with you. She just has some questions, okay? There's, that's how you create access. That's how you create a network. That's how you create, somebody comes in like Marlene and they're like, wow, this gal's great. Um, we don't, we, we like her so much, we don't want to farm her out to somebody else. We want to find a place to bring her on board our own team. That's how the job world works in many regards. Right? These cold calls, these cold applications, this harsh you up against the government computer stuff, uh, that's, 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 the, that's what the surface looks like. It's like an iceberg. Right? Think about all that's below the surface that kind of makes that iceberg stick out of the water. That's what, that's where, that's what sinks ships, is all what's below the surface. So all that stuff that's below the surface, it's your ability to network, it's your ability to ask questions, it's your ability to have an in. Because sometimes having it in is what gets you into the process itself, right? Just somebody says, hey, you know, my friend Marlene's applying for this job. You guys might want to be heads up for her application. And somebody can say, uh, well, maybe she didn't make the cert, but we're gonna, we want to pull that record because I want to take a look at it, okay? That is how the world works. So use those resources, okay? That's why you build all these relationships with your professors, isn't it? Uh, are you a professor? Yeah. Professor? Okay. <laughs> Tap into that. Um, gosh, I got an email this morning from a junior officer on board my ship. I haven't seen him since he left the ship in 2008. He sent an, an email address, to, or sent me a note today saying, hey, John, can we hook up on such and such? That's the way the world works. I got a, was in a meeting yesterday, and the whole purpose of the meeting was they want one of our alumni, they want us to find one of our alumni to hire them. They want two years experience, but you know, we have to look through our group and say, okay, who wants to might want to leave their job? So yeah, we do. We do, you know, we're constantly being approached by employers. So. Yes. That was one of the reasons we brought Colonel Rabbit to talk about the networking and informational interviewing. So that was one of the Okay, we're partners today. Things. Now I know that. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Colonel Holder. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's how I got my Easter Seals job. I had done a lot of nonprofit work with San Diego grant makers and participated in some events and became a known entity in the kind of the veteran nonprofit community. So this Easter Seals job was never advertised. Uh, my name was floated to them and they came to me, which was pretty cool. So I came to you because Colonel Sutherland, I met through Student Veterans of America because I sat on their council. And so I got to meet all their board members. And so when I emailed him, that's when he afforded me your information. Right. And he's over at the Dixon Center over by NDC. Right. So Dave Sutherland, who's a retired Army colonel, works for the Easter Seals Dixon Center in Washington, D.C. I know. Okay. So we're all connected here, right? So you contacted Dave. Dave said, hey, John, do you want this? Or do you know somebody that would be the right fit? My thought was, hey, Easter Seals, we're, we're, this is a new military veteran services. Here's people that are looking for social work opportunities. Um, I think we can, there's some called mutual and collaborative benefits here. And I already have a relationship with Dr. Uh, Hassan uh, with USC um, in LA. So this, right, this is how the world actually works. Right. People so. want to hire people that have, that are part of the network, that are in the family. Right. Yeah. And there's nothing that, you know, you can't, 
we all earn a reputation, good or bad, and so right, we're either legit or we're not legit. And then when I say, hey, well, I've met this gal, I gotta tell you, you really need to talk to her. That endorsement goes a long way, an enormously long way. Uh, and we're not, that's not just a foot in the door, that could be the whole leg or your entire body, just kind of getting in the door. I, I can't tell you the number of veterans that I'll sit down and counsel for employment opportunities, and they'll tell me that they're so depressed because they, they've applied to 600 jobs, all online, and nobody called them back. Send, send, send. Yeah. Do you think they tailored their resume to any of the job descriptions that they applied to? No. Did they know anybody? No. Did they do research or homework to, to try to make that connection? No. So I would be surprised if they got one call back. I read uh, admissions applications to get in school, and I'll read some of them <coughs> say, yes, I'm really excited to come to the University of Virginia. They have the wrong name of the university. <laughs> <laughs> Our letters of reference, and they'll be talking about how great you are, and then they'll use the wrong gender. And you're like, oh, oh no. <laughs> Thank you. That's such a beautiful thing because the whole theme of today is tailor your oh. resume, tailor it to the job you're applying for. And for me, this process, I would say for every USA job, every job I apply for, it took me at least eight hours per application because of the homework that I did trying to dissect my resume, dissect what they're looking for, and find examples from where I was where I was aligned. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous project. Okay? Enormous project. Alright, so enough talking, let's get to it, right? So here's the things that I want you to think about before you submit. This is a this is a big science project. Okay? Know what you're applying for. Read all that stuff. What are the duties? What are the prereqs? What are the quals? What about this whole questionnaire thing? What what does all this mean? Okay? And it's it's all about you. You gotta tell your story. This is your story. Right? You are the head of your own marketing department. Okay? Nobody else's. You could have a professor that's gonna endorse you, maybe a shipmate that sailed with you, you know, a guy who worked in a helicopter squadron, who knows. That's all well and good. You got to tell your own story. You got to find your own voice, and you got to find a way to express that passion that you have. Okay. So a quick math problem because you are grad school students. Your competitive opportunity is a function of. I know you're probably not math grad students. Wait, that's why we chose social work. That's okay. You know what? You guys deal with budgets. So I don't give you that stuff. Okay. Everything is a function of something, right? We're all functions of something in life, but. Your ability to be competitive, and I'm not saying get a job, but just to be competitive, you gotta be thorough. You gotta be detail-oriented. You, you gotta go way into the weeds. Because the other guy on the other, the other end of that line may be your professor. It may be a guy like me. And, and, I, and I'm kind of saying, you know what, gosh, I don't know how you got through the cert. Your resume's not tailored. You don't even talk about the, you're not, you're not even aligned with what we're looking for. Reject. It's that fast. Quick, very quick. Very quick. I'm amazed at the number of people that don't tailor their experiences. Uh, this Episcopal church that I belong to, we're looking for a new rector. So we put a parish profile online that says, here's how we see ourselves as a congregation and community. Half the applicants have not even aligned their resumes and their experiences with what we're looking for. So, okay, so I was a long-term naval officer. I'm kind of very direct, right to the point. That guy goes in the reject pile. If he's not willing to want to tailor himself to be part of us, why would we want him to be part of us? I feel the same way when people apply for government jobs. You can be the best, most highly qualified person, but if you don't tell your story and you don't act like you want the job, you're not going to get the job. That's, that's just the way it works. The job that I got for the government, a buddy of mine allegedly went in, because I heard this later, uh, and, and he'd been a long-term government employee. He was a retired Navy captain. He was an acquisition guy. He, he had a lot of experience in what they were looking for. And when they asked him the question, well, can you give us an example of this particular scenario and how you worked through the problem? His response was, it's in my resume. Ooh. Oh. Ouch. Yeah. He didn't get the job. <laughs> yes. 
but we are going to talk about some other things about how you do get jobs. So let's. So it's about being thorough. So read everything about the job. So we're going to go through an example here today about this particular vocational specialist position in Illinois. And I highlighted in red what the primary purpose of the position. Vocational rehab training, placement of veterans. Burn that into your memories, okay? Vocational rehab, training, placement for veterans. So we're going to go back and we're going to see if we're qualified. We, and I'm going to use Marlene's resume that I've kind of taken apart a little bit. Okay, we're going to really dig deep into this. So this job, ironically, closed out uh, yesterday, last night at midnight Eastern, and it's no longer available online. So we're going to do a little quick demo here for what happens when you uh, what, what happens when you screw things up. Do you want me to turn the lights off? Would that help you guys see this a little better? I think we're seeing it. You guys okay with the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I pull up uh, I, I pull up this link, and I come right to this USA Jobs position. And this link was associated with, uh, oh, hey, sorry, this job no longer open, and accepting applicants. Uh, so instead of having a crisis this morning saying, wow, I, my whole brief just got screwed up, because uh, I put this hyperlink in, I thought, okay, let's give this a try. So how about we look for, oh, let me go back so you can step in. How do I look for a job? I might know what the job title is because right, somebody kind of gave me a clue and said, oh, here's the job title or the, the series number. I can look at categories. I can look within a certain ra radius of a zip code. right? So if you're going back to where you're from, if you want to just look in San Diego. So uh, I, I found one that I liked. So I thought, let's go to all categories. Uh, and mental health was the one that I selected. I thought, is that, is that pretty nicely aligned with where you guys are heading? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Not, not necessarily in need of your own mental health support. But. All that too. Okay, so let's, let's look at that. So I just picked mental health, and I don't say where, so I, right, I, theoretically when I do my search for mental health, I ought to get it anywhere. But it shows up, so jobs within DC, so 100 mile radius of DC. I can go in there and I can change those parameters. I'm not here today to show you how to do this because nobody learns by somebody standing up at a screen telling you how to operate a computer. So I did find this one job, social worker in a mobile vet center in Richmond. Because of West Virginia, he's doing it. All right. So let's go take a look at that job. Because it's sort of aligned with where Marlene was, was pushing me in this different direction. So I pull up this job. All right. Here he is. This is a social worker. Here's all the duties. I'm going to scroll through this because we're not going to use this as a specific example, but I want to show you some things that are on there. Okay? Let's take a look. All of the jobs have these kind of elements, this summary. out some things here. The full performance level is a GS-11. Everybody know what GS ratings are for government positions? It's like a GS-1 to a GS-15. Uh, the government job that I got, they said, oh, well, you know what, You're, uh, you were a Navy captain, so I got a GS-15 job, and that's kind of the first job that I walked into. So, uh, and there are specific salary ranges that are uh, reflective of those positions. So a GS-15, uh, based on San Diego, because there's a locality pay based on that as well, there's a, there's a salary range. I, I would say that that GS-15 salary range, it's because they could have taken as low as a 13 to a GS-15. When I looked at that job, it said the salary range was $96,000 to $156,000. Well, obviously, when you look at that range, you're like, I sure would like to be at the 156 side of that, plus the 96 side of that. But it's based on your experience. So the actual grade at which the applicant may be selected for this is 
Yeah. In the well. See, look at these guys. Don't do, don't make mistakes like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> GS9 to GS11. So if you are a grad school student coming out of uh, coming out of here, uh, and, and you in particular, this young lady, uh, right? If you don't have any work experience besides kind of internship stuff, you would probably expect to come in at the lower end of the salary range because right because you don't have work in the field or equivalent experience. Right? Think that's fair. Mm -hmm. Expectation management. That's an important <laughs> aspect for any job you apply for. <laughs> Expectation <laughs> management. The salary is based on the grade and the step approved for the selected candidate. Okay? Good point to remember. So let's look at a little bit more of this. That's all kind of boilerplate stuff. That doesn't really tell you anything, right? Let's look at quals and evaluations. Here you guys are. Are you? Do you meet this? Are you? Do you have a master's degree in social work from a school accredited? Yes. Okay. Some of them will. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see how that looks in seven days. All right. So let's look at licensure. So this this says you got out of license, right? For this particular job. Jobs. To indicate at, at the master's degree level is required. Mm -hmm. Right? The government, we love to use words in the government like should and shall. Okay? But almost everything's waverable. So we'll, we'll talk about what's waverable a little bit later. So here's the experience, right? It shows you kind of where, where you fall at. Okay? Uh, let's not let's not get too wrapped up in this. All right, let's look at benefits, other information for this particular job. If you're really interested, go for that. Again, that goes for the your compensation package. You got you got to decide what's important to you. So, how to apply? Okay. Here's what happened to me last night. Right, I uh, that job I was looking at closed out on February 24th at midnight Eastern. So. That's where it disappeared. So click on the online, apply online. This, if you can read, you can do this, but you have to read everything. If you're taking a test where it says, read all the questions first, okay? And then the, and then the last sentence says, stop at question number one. So right, everybody starts, my, my wife teaches fourth grade, she messes with her kids all the time, right? So. You take the whole test, but it said read all the questions, read all the directions first, and they take the whole test and like, uh, hey, the direction said stop at question one or question two. Remember that when you do this, you have to read everything, and you have to do everything that they ask for, and you have to do it the way they ask for, it. okay? Because if you don't, someone like me is going to say, you don't, you don't know how to follow instructions. So if you're not detail oriented and apply for a job. How do I know you're going to be detail oriented when I ask you to do something that needs details? Right? Your lack of attention to detail is a reflection of your character. I'm sorry. Is that, is that too harsh? No. Okay. You guys are we're adults here. All right. So we're, we're looking at documents. Oh, here we go. Here's this questionnaire. To complete the occupational questionnaire. Oh, so let, you know what? let's look at it. Is buried in the instructions. It's, right? it's not. Yeah, and I wouldn't have ever seen that because when I look, I never looked that. I'm like, oh, this is what I need to know, and I would have never seen that. So I'm glad. That no, this was such a great practical exercise. So I, it's a thing of you. So there's a lot of stuff that's on this questionnaire. You're going to have to answer these questions, and it's <clears throat> it's going to be online, right? You're you're going to answer them. So. You're going to enter your biographic data. You're going to enter your email address. I don't like to tell grad school students you shouldn't have an email address that's offensive, right? <laughs> okay. Work information, employment, citizenship, background, other languages, lowest grade. Enter the lowest grade you will accept for this position. They'll probably have a menu. Okay. Miscellaneous special knowledge, tests, veteran preference, dates of active duty. If uh, if you have a disability rating, you're gonna have to upload the document uh, w with your rating on it. So you got to have your like your DD two fourteen for 
for veterans and say, hey, I was on active duty, here was my discharge characterization. Okay. So job preference, geographic, and this, right, there's no choice for geographic. It's Richmond. That's the job you're applying for. It's in Richmond. So if you get it and say, oh, but can I telework it? No. The job's in Richmond, right? <laughs> Be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. All right, but we're, we're getting to some good stuff here. So here we come up with some questions. I am a citizen. I have a master's degree. I understand that I have to be you know, proficient in English. Okay. I have less than one year post-master's degree in social work experience. I have a question yeah. about the master's degree question. Uh, since we are right there, do we still have to answer no? Oh. Because that's, I, I've applied for jobs on USAjobs.com, I've gone through the whole process, and the last communication I get is, you don't have your degree, because I was invalidly honest and close. We're not, you know what, you got to be honest. Yeah. Okay, so the way we're going to handle this is, you're going to, I'm going to let you make your own judgment call. Yeah. But I'm telling you, if you say no, and the prerequisite is you have to have a master's degree and you say yeah, no, yeah. don't expect anybody to call yeah. you. But if you say yes, and then you write a cover letter, then you just say, um, I have indicated yes on the application that I will have my master's degree because I am on track for completion of my degree in May of 2014. Um, I did that to a because I want to demonstrate to you the passion that I have for that position. Because I'm so committed to your cause, I want to be part of your team. Okay? Cool. <laughs> you want to be bold? You know? I've got my card. Okay? We'll talk about bold. Right? That's that's your judgment call. You're an adult. Right? This is an adult environment. But if you say no and the prerequisite says master's degree, you're not going to make it to that sort of Right? The HR people aren't going to let you get through. But your cover letter is going to let you get through to the, you know, saying yes will let you get through the HR people. Then the actual people that are going to hire you are going to read your cover letter. And they may say, oh, you know what? We're, we're looking for three people. It's okay for us to have a brand new straight out of grad school individual. All right, let's, let's get to, there we go. That's what I wanted to remember show you on this questionnaire. Alright, so for each task, so read through all that for me, down through E. Subjective or objective? This criteria. Subjective. Subjective. Okay. I am an expert. Okay. Uh, you guys work with clients, right? Everybody's done some internships. Uh, vocational. We're gonna let, let's think about that other job. Uh, vocational. Uh, job placement, uh, rehabilitation for veterans. Any of you guys work with veterans in any of your social work? Okay. Would you consider yourself an expert in that field right now? Okay. If you're the book smart person and everybody comes to you because, say, you have great knowledge of kind of social work legislation, could you say you're an expert in that? Can you say anything you, you, say anything you want? If I could come up with an answer on my own, on the spot, and I know that I could do it, then I would consider myself an expert in that situation. But that's in like in that situation, but I think as of me working with veterans and just what I've done, I kind of have already done the vocational rehab kind of thing during my undergrad, but I still wouldn't consider myself 
of expert as of yet because I feel like you need to get to that level. That's fair. Yet. Everybody think that's fair? Yeah. Like, knucklehead Navy captain, retired 28 years in the military. Um, do you think I understand processes and how to find efficiencies and in, in, in procedures and in the way to find to execute a process? Uh, yeah, I've done it all my adult career. Um, does it necessarily have to be in the job that I'm looking for? No. If, if the question's about processes, uh, then I could say that I'm an expert. If the question says uh, finding efficiencies in vocational rehab for veterans that have mental uh, illnesses, I really can't say I'm an expert in that. But I could say I'm an expert in a portion of what they're looking for. So I'm not telling you to lie. I'm not telling you to embellish. I'm telling you to be honest, but tell, find a way to tell your story. So let's look at the first question that maintains an effective resource database used to identify external programs and address the needs of a client veteran. So have, you got, have, have you done any of those, that kind of work in, the, in your experiences right now? Okay, so you've done stuff. So are you an A? You have no education training? No. You, you use a client database, right, in your internship, spreadsheet, a whiteboard that's a tracking board. <laughs> okay. Is, 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 that a, uh, is, is that a database that, that tracks progress? It's a database that tracks progress. It's kind of old school. It's like being in the, ate in the mech shop at HSC 23. <laughs> Maybe, but it tracks a process. Right? I can be an expert in this, but not necessarily have anything to do with social work. Don't know how to be a database. Don't know how to use utilize a database. So, creatively think about about what your experiences are. How about this number eight? You guys work with clients and veterans. Do you have a network of other service providers and resources? Oh, by the way, you just got one more today. Easter Seal, Southern California, just got added to your network. Okay? You got, you, you've got somebody that's far enough along the lines that maybe you'll handle the mental health side of this, but you need somebody that can provide vocational kind of one-on-one -on -one specialists and link them into the network? Guess, so you no longer are just a, 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 an A on maintain a relationship with an external resource, okay? Creatively think about your background and experiences, okay? Creatively think. Now, let's, let's look at, uh, let's scroll down to number nine. Do, do you fit that anywhere? Where do you think you might fall out on that? A through E. And if you pick a letter, you, if you pick a letter that's B or greater, you got to be able to have something in your resume that demonstrates that. Okay? After you see these questions, will you have a chance to, is, does this series of questions come before or after something in your resume? It comes before. Okay. So you can't right. edit your resume after you see So John Funk's kitchen counter mm -hmm. has all this stuff printed out, and I have the duties, and then I have a stack that has the questionnaire, and then I have my resume. Mm -hmm. And that resume is just growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. So when I say, in this job, did I, I pick a couple of those elements and make sure that I demonstrate that I've got some requisite background and experience in it. But if, I, if, it, if it was nowhere in that job, but it was in this, the next job, then make sure I hit it. So everything in here, every one of those things, every number uh, sentence there, essentially is a prerequisite. Do you have background and experience in it? And you, you probably didn't have to do it in every, all of those in every job, but you should have done all of those in at least one job somewhere, okay? If you, if you ignore it and think, well, if I just, if I just ignore it, maybe they'll just realize that I'm just don't, don't have experience. Don't that then they you wind up in the re reject pile. Okay. Address everything in here. Okay. All right. So we're going to jump out of that questionnaire. Uh, let's, let's, let's 
come back to this one more time. There's one other thing I want to show you. How am I doing time-wise? Okay. And Kara, you had some, um, uh, do you have a presentation too? Or um, just question and answering kind of thing? Yeah, it's kind of, I'll, I'll okay. ask the questions, uh, say some opening comments. Okay. Okay, and please interrupt me as we go. All right, let, let's just go back to this. So we should you wear that, that was in the how to apply section. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and then we go to more info. It's, it's going to tell us kind of more specific things. And then how to apply it's going to say the things that need to be in my resume. So all of these documents need to be in that package. So they're going to give you a checklist here. You got to, you got to make sure that you've got everything. Right? Prior military, D214, proof of service. Okay? If they ask for it, give it. If, if they ask for it and you don't provide it, don't expect anybody to call you. Okay? Harsh adult world. All right, so let's let's keep on cranking here. So let, I, I want to go back. So we're going to talk about this particular job. And we're, we're going to dissect this a little bit more. And we're going to use that as the example. So here's all those duties that are listed. And these are the this is the order that it, they were listed on on USA Jobs. So if I number them one through X, what they list first is obviously what I think they they're telling me that's the highest priority. That's what they're looking for. Okay. Here's more. Here's more of these duties. So your resumes need to show examples of how you have experience and background in these particular areas. Here's when they kind of differentiate those qualifications. I would imagine for most of you, when you're looking at some of these jobs, and the irony is, this job that, that Marlene and I looked at together was really this, almost the same prerequisites as what I just showed you for that job in Russia. <coughs> you're gonna enter at the GS9 level because you have a master's degree program that had an internship, okay? You don't enter at the GS11 level unless you have one four-year professional vocational rehab counseling experience, okay, on top of your degree. Is there not a GS10? Oh, there is a GS10. So then what would you qualify yourself for if you were a GS10, like a half a year experience? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you have a, a year's worth of experience, but it's in a different field. Okay. So when they give you that range, you could come in at the GS10. You could come in at the at the bottom level of the nine, or the top level of the nine, and that could be a, maybe a ten, twenty thousand degree, twenty thousand dollar differential in pay. So again, fight for your pay. Okay, ask ask for compensation. Give me a call if you want me to help coach you through. You don't want to piss anybody off and then not get a job at all. <laughs> right? That would that would be bad. Uh, but you can't get what you don't ask for. Right? A lot of people say. Gosh, you know what? You say uh, I asked for fifty thousand dollars, but I would have taken forty. You never tell that to your boss, right? Because he said, "Well, you know what? You asked for fifty. I would have given you sixty. Right? You don't. You don't want to have that conversation, right? Nobody talks about salary. So the fact that I'm standing up here throwing numbers out to you—that's nobody ever talks about that. I don't. I don't know why. Because it's more frankly, it's one of your biggest questions, isn't it? Like, you do have to be able to live. You have to be able to take care of yourself and your family needs. These knowledge, skills, abilities, KSA, anybody heard that expression before? Knowledge, skills, abilities? Okay. These are very interesting because for this particular job, remember it's 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 a vocational rehab, uh, right? Vocational rehab training and placement of veterans. Not all those are necessarily aligned with that. So I think about this because these are really strong elements that you could embed in your resume that don't necessarily directly apply to the specific duty, but that's you. Working with this wide spectrum of different people. So uh, let me share here. In describing your experience, be clear, be specific. We will not make assumptions regarding your experience. Again, it's your story. You don't tell it, nobody's going to hear it. Okay? And they're not going to make anything up. They're not going to assume anything about you without that. 
Okay, you might be asked for additional information. Your resume and documentation will be verified. Follow instructions, errors or omissions. They may affect your rating or consideration for employment. What does that mean? Spelling errors. Spelling errors, typos, and, what, and where do you think that's going to put you? Rejected. Yeah, in the circular file, right? Trash can? Yeah. Okay. Sailors, military guys, good, okay. All right, so I went back and I looked at uh, the questions for that criteria uh, for, this, for this other job that we looked at, and boy, they really look exactly the same, don't they? Mm -hmm. This, I have experience, I'm considered an expert, okay? You're gonna grade yourself, and again, that HR person's gonna, they're gonna say, gosh, you know what, this person said D and E for everything, but there's nothing in their resume that supports that. Reject, right, don't make the certification that fast. So I threw out some of uh, these were different questions uh, that appeared as just a section uh, that kind of went along with the how do I evaluate myself. Okay, so let's talk about your resume. This is straight off of USA Jobs. I didn't write any of this all myself, by myself. This is all me just copy paste. So look at the things that they want. Description of job. Name, address, title, beginning and end date, average hours, supervisor's name and phone number. You don't have that on your standard resumes right now, do you? No. Okay, you shouldn't. But you need to have it on your government job. If you, if you throw up your standard resume now and you don't have this stuff, don't expect to get a call. Okay? They said to put it in there, you chose not to put it in there, you're not, you're not going to be on the team. Okay? Education, licenses. Description of duties must sufficiently detail the level of experience. Okay, if you think you need to write 20 bullets in that particular internship you had because you need to address all those areas that were on the questionnaire and the duties, then do that. There's no page limit. Okay, but they need to be real. You need to be truthful, but they but they need to be there. Okay, government job if you had one if you were in the military. Okay, so now let's talk about you. This is really the theme behind this whole day today. It's, it's all about tailoring your story and telling it your way. Okay? You're your head or you're, you're the president of the marketing firm for your own individual company. Okay? And every time you apply for a job, you have to tailor it to the job and what they're looking for. I, I know I'm sounding like a, a repeated record here, but I am blown away by the number of people that don't do this over and over again. And I think part of it is because this is hard. This is a lot of work to dissect all that information and then rewrite yourself for that particular job. But you know, once you do it once and you're still kind of applying for similar like jobs, save that resume. Right? I call it John Funk resume, vocational rehab, Richmond, Virginia. February 25th, 2014. And then when another job comes up that's similar, I was like, oh gosh, you know what, let me go back to that. I already did a lot of the legwork for that. Let me print that back out and see how they apply, and I'm just gonna cherry pick and put stuff back in. That's how I work my resume and, and different files, okay? Because this is hard. But if you're just hitting send, 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 don't expect to call, 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 call. It won't, even be, it won't be call me, maybe it'll be call me not at all. All right, so let's look at this particular resume from this uh, graduate school student that I know. So here's a couple of examples, and they're very brief and succinct on an existing resume. And remember the job that we're applying for here is specifically vocational rehab, training, and job placement for veterans. Okay, that's, that's what we're looking for. So do, do any of these, do either of these two positions really align with those? On the surface, no. But there's some other things in there. Right, right now we're not talking, even talking about veterans at all. Okay, but we did talk about client and case management, right? There are aspects of 
the support network for the people that are involved in the program. Okay. There's uh, knowledge, skills, and activities uh, that, that align with this. Communicate with a, one of those knowledge skills. Uh, number three, it said communicate with a wide variety of injuries from varying backgrounds. Ability to motivate and counsel patients. Uh, is, is that in here? Ability to motivate and counsel patients? Stakeholders, the students and their families? So I'm not, I'm not trying to stretch this too far, but I think there, there's clearly some things that Marlene's got in her background that demonstrates that she can do that. But look, what else has she done? Oh, wow, now we finally got one. Veteran outreach. Provide outreach to veterans in the community. So Marlene needs to explain that a little bit more. What kind of outreach did she actually do? Was it... Was it rehabilitation? Was it mental health counseling? Was it reacclimation into society? Was it ever job related? So Mar Marlene has some homework to do to help me do this. Oh wow, you know what? She actually already did that. Assisted recently discharged service members. So when I say um, provide job coaching, job, job academy, accommodation and adaptation services, that's the fourth primary duty for that particular job. Marlene's already got a little bit of a background. She needs to explain this a little bit more. What kind of outreach? What kind of assistance? You gotta be in depth here because you gotta align with the responsibilities that you're looking for. Well, she did this sailor thing for a long time. Did she counsel a lot of people? Absolutely. Does she have did she have to learn how to work with a very wide spectrum and diverse group of individuals? Absolutely, right? From every walk of life, uh, ranks, socioeconomical backgrounds. I mean, the whole spectrum of folks is what anybody in the military has demonstrated their ability to do that. Would you <clears throat> spell out United States or leave it US? The US is okay. Okay. I just wasn't. Right, you're not in the space-saving mode on a federal job application, all right? And I bet you could throw all kinds of uh, social worker acronyms at me that I would have no idea what you're talking about, okay? And, and, I could, and by the way, I could do the same as a federal, former federal employee and a, and a military guy, and a Navy guy, and a helicopter guy, and a ship driver, okay? And a boat school graduate, okay? So I, we, we all can do that. You, you have to spell out everything so it's crystal clear to anybody. Okay, so this cover letter. Let's let's talk about the cover letter. Should you do one? Well, since we haven't graduated yet, then yeah. Sure, and after you graduate, even more so. All right, so what does the cover letter do? Do you have any philosophy on cover letters? Anybody say, talk about them in the past with you? I've heard a lot of people say they don't like them. And I've heard a lot of people, but the jobs I'm applying for now want them. But I know a lot of people that don't like them, so it's kind of. All right, let me talk about cover letters and what I think. I think you ought to write. I think they be, should be brief and succinct. So I have uh, two of my own sea stories. And the bottom one is that elephant. There's the elephant in the room. Sometimes there's a big elephant. And I have family situations like where people, there's like this real big issue, but nobody wants to talk about it. Right, and it's just it's constantly around. Maybe that's just my family. Uh, <laughs> all right, so there's that elephant in the room. So the, the, the government job that I applied for that I got said that I had to be this level three acquisition experience, acquisition professional. Uh, that generally takes people like five years of their careers doing it full time again. I didn't have it. I didn't need, so they wanted level three qual. I didn't even have level one which is just take a couple of classes online. I didn't have any of them. But it's, and that was a prerequisite, but it said, but if you don't have the qualification, it has to be attained within two years of getting the job. And that was kind of in the small print. So in my cover letter, I came right out and said, I realize that I do not have this qualification that is required. However, my background and experience that I bring to the position more than compensates for my lack of acquisition experience. There we go. Address the elephant in the room. So on your, on, when it, how do you check the boxes on the... I said I didn't have a qual. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have it. But I somehow got through the cert. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because I had a lot of other stuff. Okay. Right? It's it's not essentially kind of a one or zero. Okay. For each for each question. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I so I apply for this job at Easter Seals. Right? They came they come to me. And they're looking for five years of nonprofit experience. And I had goose egg. So I said um, in the cover letter, my resume demonstrates the breadth of my experience and background. However, what, what my, um, am I totally screwing this up? Okay. Because I'm really not interested in being on the camera anymore. I said, but, but what my resume doesn't cover is it does not demonstrate my passion for veterans issues and social causes. So here's, here's what I have done in a volunteer capacity that demonstrates my community involvement. And I talked about my volunteer work that I didn't have in my resume anywhere. Uh, and how does that background apply? I'm an admissions counselor for the Naval Academy. I am a mentor for a recently released inmate from the East Mesa Detention Facility. And met with him for a half a year while he was still in prison and now I'm through his rehabilitation program. Uh, I'm on a committee for uh, the board of directors for a, a thing called Support the Enlisted Project that provides emergency financial support to uh, enlisted junior enlisted members and their families. So I listed those activities that I participate to say, hey, I, I, I'm not a, right, I, I don't work for a nonprofit, but I do nonprofit like work in my off time. Okay, so I was able to address what I'll call the elephant in the room and show, hey, there's more to John Funk than just my resume. You know, when I'm off work, these are the choices that I get to make, and here's how they demonstrate that. So I say that's where you lay it on. Okay, you know, if you're particularly passionate, if, if you want to go back to Hines, Illinois, for that particular job because that's where you're from, you know. I've been away from Illinois. I want to go back there because I'm passionate and I want to contribute back in my community. And this, this position gives me the opportunity to do that. That's not in your resume anywhere, right? But, but you get to say it. So this is where you get to be passionate. And you're not applying for technical jobs. You're applying for jobs that are, you get to go make a difference with people. Wow. There's a lot of honorable things uh, to, to do for employment. I can't think of many that would, uh, exceed what you guys are all getting ready to go to. I, I think it's incredible. So you get to be passionate in those letters. Because I would imagine that the people that want to employ you want people that are passionate. They want talent. They want, they, they'll accept your lack of experience, frankly, for talent and passion. I, basketball teams that hire all those guys that are superstars that all operate independently, right? they don't win championships because they don't know how to play on a team. Right? I'd, rather, I'd rather hire people that are less qualified, that are passionate, uh, than, than a bunch of experts that frankly don't give a damn and all they're doing is pushing a clock and getting a paycheck. Right? That's not what you're gonna go do in your professional lives. So here's your chance, be passionate about it. Tell your story, okay? Tell why you want that job. It, it shouldn't be a dissertation, okay? It probably shouldn't be more than about three or four paragraphs anyway. But here's your chance, if you wanna, and I view this as you look in the mirror and say, you know, did, I, did I give it all that I had? Did I, did I say everything that I wanted to say? Um, here's your chance to do that. Because the application is really restrictive, right? It forces you inside this, this, these boundaries. Guess what? You get to go out of the boundaries. And if people say, ah, oh, cover letters, it, boy, if it's passionate to the point, I'll say, you know what? I kind of like that. Um, boy, I, I want somebody like that. And all the folks that I saw for federal employment jobs, frankly, they got hired, had cover letters, and they talked about why they wanted the job. You don't, gosh, you don't want to hire somebody that doesn't want the job. Right? So, it's just a thought. It's just one guy. That's why this brief is called a perspective. It's one guy's perspective. Okay, I'm just one guy's perspective. Okay, that's all. Right? Tell people why you're so special. There's hundreds of people applying for every job out there. Right? What's going to make you different? What makes you stand out? How'd you get into the USC grad school program in the first place? Right? Hundreds, thousands of people apply for, 
for, for, middle, for very few spots in everything in the United States. How do people get picked and how do they get the right pick? I don't know. Right. What, what makes you stand out? And finally, let's talk about Easter Seals. We've got a pretty uh, snazzy program and it's available for transitioning veterans. And frankly, while I would say veterans uh, in this program are probably outside of our criteria, which is they've probably been off active duty for two years um, or more, we uh, are happy to extend the services that are available to kind of help walk you through that process. And what's, what's unique about this and why I went to Easter Seals in the first place is we don't do it in classroom settings, we do it all one-on-one. -on -one. You, you get a vocational an, an employment specialist that walks you through this entire process. Um, they're there to help coach you, uh, motivate you, give you a hug if you need a hug, if you kick in the ass if that's what you need to, uh, and help you walk through that process, and then help open doors into this network that we all bring individually and that Easter Seals um, has connected us with. So that, that's what we provide at Easter Seals. So if, if you're interested, I've got cards available. I'd be more than happy to, to kind of align with you uh, individually. Um, and the other employment specialist besides me, We've got a guy that was a former Marine, wounded in, a, in Iraq in an IED explosion on a uh, Humvee. He has three of his buddies were killed. He lost his left arm, his shoulder, his entire right side of his face was fractured. He's one of the, the kindest, gentlest guys I've ever met. Um, and then we've got a gal that worked in the Army in the 90s. So we're a little bit of the spectrum right now. We're specifically uh, aligning employment opportunities for people looking for jobs in San Diego. Uh, and we will ex we expect to expand to all Southern California from the border to San Luis Obispo sometime in the next year or two. So that's that's where we're at right now. Um, what's what's a what's a beautiful benefit of it is we're not out there trying to drive up money. This isn't a fee for service event. Uh, the Bob Hope Legacy Fund through Bob Hope's grandchildren have uh, sponsored this uh, program, so they can continue to do what their grandfather did, which was kind of reach out and support veterans. So we get to be part of that legacy so so it's available uh, as am I so my email address was on the uh, front slide and I'd be happy to, to meet with any of you individually if you want to talk through things if you want to bounce an idea off if you want to send a cover letter and say all right John do you think I'm bold enough I'll let you know if you're bold enough or too bold. okay but I don't, I, frankly I don't know if you can be too bold I, I really don't know if you can be People want passionate people to work for them. So there's your chance. So, but I, I'm available. Okay, as are other employment specialists as well. So that's what I got. You gotta follow that up now. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, John, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, you did a great job. And what I want to do is just piggyback on what uh, John uh, had to say, and I'm going to focus because you, you did a great job with the, uh, the application process. I'm going to focus more on the networking, social aspects of getting a job. Okay, so um, a little bit about me. How many minutes do I have for um, We're good until 12:50. Okay, good. A um, little bit about me, I've uh, been in the VA for 31 years, okay. I started off as a student intern, uh, and uh, my route into the VA was very indirect, and that's why I think that's why I'm here to talk to you about this, because it's, it's one thing going through the formal process, but there's another process of just doing the work and going out there and digging the trail and looking for a job. Um, when I uh, started, uh, I worked at, uh, my internship was at the Westside VA, it was now the Jesse Brown VA in Chicago. Uh, after that experience, I decided that, you know, yeah, I'll do the VA. So, uh, I, actually, Heinz VA was my first employment uh, with the VA. And to get in to the HR department, there was a, a volunteer who was, you had to get through. <laughs> he had this list, and he would say, um, what do you want, and uh, what job? Well, there's no job on this list, so you may want to come back again. So uh, every time I would go, I got rejected. 
And then uh, I decided to get smart, and I decided that I would come in uh, a little bit early than I normally did and uh, recon the area. Uh, and I selected the time where he was away from his post. I <laughs> walked in to the door of personnel, and uh, I went up to uh, receptionist, and I said, hey, my name's Dave Rapp. You know, I just graduated from school. I'm really uh, looking to be a social worker. Uh, I did my placement uh, at the uh, uh, West Side VA, and no joke. Back then, they used to pay. Uh, they used to have, you had paychecks. They didn't, it wasn't electronic. And the secretary for the chief of social work was picking up the checks for the department. And she overheard me speak, uh, and she said, she came up to me and said, so you're a social worker. She said, follow me. So I followed her. <laughs> and she went right into the uh, chief's office, the chief of social work office, and said, give him a job. And the chief said, huh? She said, give him a job. Her name was Mr. Chase. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, the chief said, well, you know, we don't have a job to give right now. But, but we know that there's going to be a retirement in a couple of months. If you're willing to come on, and we can't take your insurance or you know, anything, we can bring you on a few bases. Uh, as soon as that person leaves, you get the job. Thank you. And I've uh, been, uh, been with VA ever since. Um, so I uh, worked in a contract nursing home program, let me just start from the jump street and say that if you work for VA, it's a very rewarding job. It's very, very rewarding. But it is very demanding. Okay? That's no joke. Uh, I like uh, John when he was talking about uh, the SES and what he thought that uh, he should have gotten. Uh, it's important that you know your worth. Okay? There's work and worth. You have to balance that out. And if you find a job, don't do it just because of the money. All right? Because you're going to get disappointed. You have to find something that you believe in, something that will motivate you to get up and do what you do. And uh, that's what uh, happened with me, uh, is that uh, I've been with the VA. Uh, for many years, and it's not because of the money. <laughs> I can assure you, I could be making bank somewhere else. <laughs> but I really believe in uh, what uh, the VA is, is, is in, in terms of taking care of uh, uh, service members and veterans and the families. I'm, I'm into that. I can do that. Uh, I don't even look at my paycheck these days. You know, I just work. Uh, and so, it's important that you, you find the, the, the job that's right for you. And it, it, it should be effortless. Okay? It should be a job where you go in and it's, <coughs> it's not like a major struggle. This is what you want to do, this is who you are, and you can contribute. Okay? So, my first uh, job was uh, with uh, the contract nursing home. And these are World War II veterans, World War I veterans, the nursing home. My job was to visit them to make sure that they were being taken care of and uh, be a liaisons to the VA on medical issues. And uh, announced to me, there were also Vietnam era veterans in these nursing homes. Because back in the early 80s, we were uh, putting uh, veterans in nursing homes, uh, these Vietnam era veterans, uh, because they, we didn't know what to do with them, pretty much. We institutionalized them um, because uh, they had severe PTSD. At that time, PTSD was a emerging uh, uh, issue. And so I did that, and it was interesting because they saw me coming. I was a young social worker, and my caseload was over 100. 100. Now I think about it, you know, it wasn't years until we learned in terms of the case management model that an average caseload should be 60 to 70. And I was running 100. Okay, anyway. But I wouldn't be who I am if I did not do what I do, okay, or did. 
then I worked at the, um, I decided to move to Minneapolis, and I uh, worked uh, there as the HIV AIDS social worker. And uh, what John was saying is that you negotiate. When I, I just wanted to move to Minneapolis. I heard that was a great place to raise family, et cetera. It was all time for us, my wife and I, to, to, to raise family. And so um, we selected that. So, and what's cool, cool about the Veterans Administration is you can, you can change. once you're in the system, you can, you can go and find another job within the system. Uh, matter of fact, my brother uh, recently, uh, he was in Minnesota, he just found a job, uh, he transferred to a job in New Mexico, uh, in Albuquerque. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a seamless type of uh, thing. So that's, that's a good thing. It's like the military, you can transfer based on where you want to go. Um, so, um, but with the HIV, HIV AIDS job, what happened was uh, it was just a part-time job. And I said, well, I can't do part-time. So, see ya, you know? And, but by the time I got back to Chicago, they called me up and said, we have a full-time job for you. We'll piece something together, right? And uh, so I did that. And then I, uh, after a couple of years, because of my leadership, I uh, became a supervisor. And uh, I worked uh, uh, ahead of the Program called Special Programs, and it was uh, about ten, about ten social workers that worked in geriatric drag. They worked uh, uh, dialysis, uh, uh, oncology, and just special programs. But then um, there were some changes, and they wanted me to uh, not only do that; they wanted me to do another division and uh, inpatient, uh, yeah, the inpatient. Service. So they gave me all these inpatient social workers, and I had this outpatient. So I had about 20 social workers that I was uh, providing uh, supervision, clinical supervision, which is really good for those who need it. Because uh, uh, if you don't, if your agency don't pay for it, or you don't get it in, in house, you're not going to pay for it yourself. And I used to have a private practice where I used to charge people $120 an hour to, uh, to do the supervision. Okay, and that was years ago. So uh, find a job that you can get your, your supervision built in as much as possible. I have a daughter who is now 21. She's a little bit behind y'all in that uh, she will be graduating with a bachelor's degree uh, from social work uh, school in St. Paul. But she's already freaking out about the supervision thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, slow down. And let me tell you all, too, slow down, slow down. You're where you're supposed to be, you know, coming out of the gates, you're a little bit nervous. But I'm here to tell you, you will get a job. You will get a job. You will get a job. You will make a difference, OK? So it, it'll be OK. You'll find your way. You'll find your way. Um, so. I, I had this uh, supervisory job for about, uh, oh, I was supervised about 12 years. And then uh, what happened was this work, work, work situation, you know, it got to the point where I said, you know what, this is just too much. I don't mind working, but you got to pay me. So I went to my boss, who is the director of uh, medical services, Dr. And I said, you know, I need a raise. And she said, yes, you do. <laughs> you work very hard, and I'll support that 100%. I'm like, cool. So we went to HR. HR came in, they said, uh, we need to do a, a, an assessment, a survey. And they're like, they did the survey, and they said, thumbs up. You know, basically, yeah, you're, you deserve to be at the next level. But it has to go to the director of the medical center to approve. So I went up to him, and he decided, no. And this is where the worth work comes. Uh, I backed away. I took a risk. I said, I know how much I'm worth. And uh, I applied for another job. The job that I applied for, actually, is the job uh, that pretty much I have now. It's a, it was a, 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 a virtual job. There were about 70 people around the country applying for this one job. 70. And they were, I was a GS-12 at the time. The job was a GS-14. 
and um, they said we will consider a GS12. So I had to compete with 13s uh, as well as uh, others. And, and uh, the reason I got the job was because, unlike most of the candidates, I was very transparent. When they asked me a question about how are you going to work in a virtual world, you know, the technology and this and that, and we, you know, you got to coordinate this and that, I said, I don't think I'm the right person for the job. <laughs> you know, I know, I know how to use spreadsheets, I know how to get you on know, a word I, I can do PowerPoint all day, but I'm not the right person for this job because what I'm into is the people behind the fax machine, the people behind the technology. I'm a social worker, that's what I do. I work people, I work men. And uh, within about two, three hours, I get a call, you got the job. A year later, I asked, why did I, they select me, and they said, we asked that one question, everybody else got lost. They were talking about all this technical stuff, and, and uh, you know, they said, you were the only one who talked about relationships. So I'm telling you today, relationships are very important. And that is going to be the backdrop in which, with the platform in which I talk to you, to say that, um, you know, half um, uh, the equation is the, you know, it's not even half, I would say about 20%. The 30% is the application process. The rest is knowing people. It's networking, all right? And it's, you gotta have some skills. You have to have some experience. But what is really important is that you need to know people. And that's what social workers is all about. So I mean, you know, just do what y'all have been trained to do, okay? Show up at events where um, agencies are there, right? Show up. Uh, have a, if you don't have a car, you need to create one real quick, right? Uh, and then you need to follow up uh, when you get your cards. Recently, go. So right now, I think all of us pretty much have our cards, and it might say like um, you know social work candidate or something like that on it, and it might us. So what would you recommend that now because we're about to graduate, what they should probably look like now, like how that would go? Does that make? Am I making sense? Okay, so within the, uh, I would say right now, the candidate until you get. Right. Well, okay, I'm hoping once you that. Get degree, then you change it in terms of what it's supposed to look like, or so just take off the candidate card, yeah, just, leave yeah, it, just yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, point of contact information. Um, yeah. This, you know, point of uh, email address, all that. So it's it's more in terms of that. What's you know how they can they reach you, mm -hmm. and that's that's the important part. Um, recently, I was at an event. They I don't know if you were aware that they recently opened. Uh, the Inspire Aspire Center, uh, uh, and it was on President's Day. Now, I'm a federal employee, I could have took the day off, right? But I went there for the simple fact that I wanted to network. And I came back home with about uh, at least two 20 cards, and uh, followed up, or people have followed up with me. It's about, again, it's about the net. I have a friend, um, his name was uh, Clay, and Clay was the director of the uh, San Diego VA Medical Center, uh, social worker chief of the, uh, he recently retired. But I tell you, Clay uh, and I go way back, we started actually back in Chicago. Um, uh, he was the chief student, and I was an intern. And then he moved uh, to Minneapolis, I moved to Minneapolis, he went you know, for the ring, the ring is being a chief or director. You know, I went my way, you know, in terms of leadership, and now we're at this plateau. But he, he recently, uh, he recently retired. But I can remember uh, a couple years ago trying to uh, to get someone uh, to work, uh, you know, because of the connection that I had. And uh, you know, and Clay was honest, and he was up front. He said, "This is this." He said, "David," because he values the mission, the VA's mission. He said. If the person is not a veteran or have not worked with veterans and families for at least two years, I'm not going to even talk to them. You know, I don't care what school they went to, I don't care, you know, they need that experience. 
and they're not a veteran or they have been in a setting where they work with, you know, uh, veterans or families, uh, I'm not going to say uh, let them go and get some experience and come back, <laughs> and then we'll talk, but uh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, that was his philosophy. Okay. Recently, I um, hired, uh, actually, it is hiring uh, <sighs> over the last couple of months. It's a long process. So when you were talking, I'm on the other end of seeing all of those um, the information <coughs> come in from HR. I'm surfing through um, to uh, find that carrot that that go, you know. And uh, so what I, you know, what I do is I I, I might give a, uh, a certification, we call it a cert, uh, a list of people who are qualified for the position. You might get a hundred applications, only you know six or fourteen or six of them are qualified because they didn't meet uh, the criteria or they didn't write it in. And, and I tell you, he, what he was saying: be very specific and throw everything in the kitchen sink <laughs> on the paper, right? Uh, and I can tell you, the person that I hired who will start March 9th, uh, GS13. <laughs> program specialist, I can tell you why I hired her. And it may help you. Okay, one, I was looking for talent. I call it three T's. Talent. Talent. You gotta have some talent. You know, you have to show me some talent. You have to show me some experiences, too. Yeah, I just don't want somebody who is, uh, you know, just, just one way monolithic uh, in their approach, or just, you know, I want person who has broad perspective, but they bring to the organization some, some skills that we don't have, or I can uh, monopolize. So I was looking for talent. Um, I was looking for time management in terms of people uh, able to take uh, a project and get it done, hit the deadlines, and, uh, and, and be successful. Okay. So that, that's, you know, time management is very important because you're going to be hit with a lot of demands and you need people who are self-directed and self-motivated to do the work, right? <laughs> then the third um, was technology, believe it or not. I wanted someone who uh, was familiar uh, with uh, the latest technology. And, um, uh, you know, I can't stress that. Uh, you gotta, you got to be proficient. And, uh, and the more technology you know, the better, because it's getting quicker, faster, and it's important that uh, you're able to do that. Um, okay, so let me uh, look at the time. I, I wrote some notes to myself so I could pinpoint more. Let me see what else. Okay, so we talked about three T's. Colonel Sutherland, I love him. He wrote this paper called A Sea of Goodwill. Have you read it? Yeah. It's a really, it's a really good, he talked about uh, uh, how many uh, veterans' uh, websites and uh, programs are out there, and it's sometimes overwhelming. I mean, there's like over like 8,000 websites, and it's like, oh, you need somebody to help you surf through all that. And that, that uh, but I have to say that. There's a, a uh, website called My Career, My Career at VA. Uh, you may want to consider that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the interviewing process. Okay, let's say you are uh, selected for an interview. How do you go about that? And you will be selected for an interview. Um, and something that John said, uh, I can't uh, uh, you know, say enough, and that is uh, practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. You have to put a lot of uh, time and effort in how you want to come across and what you want to deliver. Um, so you, you, need to, you need to practice uh, what you're going to say on somebody else. Um, the VA, the other federal agencies are very uh, into uh, behavioral, uh, what do you call it, behavioral, um, what do they call it, uh, behavioral-based interviewing. Google it, behavioral-based interviewing. And 
and basically uh, there are certain questions that we ask people that are open-ended and it focuses on um, uh, areas that you may as a, as a, as a uh, an employee you, you want to uh, focus on. But please look at, and they have sample questions, but you can go through that and, and uh, come up with your own questions because uh, definitely you're going to see it. Um, the other thing is uh, <coughs> ask for the job. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? Good though. No, it is. It's trust me. I, I, I have interviewed at least a hundred or so people. I've hired at least, and well, I should say, yeah, I've hired at least thirty people. One of the things I look for is that passion. I look for the experience, but also I'm looking for them asking for the job. You got, you got people who will interview, 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 and razzle, dazzle you and all that, and it's all good. But they never ask for the job. So here's a, a Colonel Rab thing. Uh, and again, I keep it in, please. Ask for the job. When you go in for the interview, you know, uh, join the local and you know, you say, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and you know, I really would love to work here. I've done my research and I think this is a great agency, etc. Back off. And in the middle of the uh, interview, you're listening. Do some listening. That's not about you. You know, do some listening about where they're going, direct some questions in terms of their challenges. Etc. Um, after you get a little bit of what they're saying, you say, "Oh, I have, I have a, a similar experience, you know, doing this, or you know, so tying it up, you know, connecting the dots." But then say, "You know, I would that I, that's right up my alley. I really want to work here. You know, this is so great." <laughs> and then at the end, you know, at the end of you, you 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 ask for the job, you know. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say? Yes, <laughs> I want the job. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I really uh, think that I would work out here, et cetera. Anyway, so ask for the job. And I'm, I'm a, no joke, this last person I hired, um, the, one of the reasons, and I was listening for it, she was the only person who alluded to it. She, what she said is, I would love to hear back from you. It was indirect. Uh, but the other people that uh, I interviewed, um, five of them that I interviewed, um, they didn't get close to it. Okay, so I asked them to go. Um, follow up on the interview, you know, with a letter, uh, perhaps, but not just a letter, a card written in your writing. My wife is really good at that. And I can tell you, it's interesting, as, as you're, as John was talking, my wife is also a social worker. And uh, because we're, you know, from Minnesota, uh, it's, it's different being out here. And uh, in Minnesota, she only uh, interviewed one time she had job for her job. And she, she had about five or six jobs over her career. But the rest was through word of mouth. It's, again, developing the network and uh, working the that. So again, yeah, that's uh, that's going to be critical. Um, I have said as much as I want to say. Let me wrap it up by saying um, what John presented is really. Uh, in VA, we use it as a screening process. There's a lot of people who won't even go through the process of completing the application. So we already screened out, you know, 50% of people who may be motivated or, you know, the ones who are not going to be motivated to work. So if you really want the job, you got to go for it. Okay? And, um, this, uh, you know, keep uh, make sure you, you spell check. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen uh, some that I put I have put in, in, in 
the other path. It's like, oh, I'm like, you know, I mean, come on. Um, so uh, make sure you give it to someone else to, 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 to look over when you send it out. All right. Well, that uh, concludes my my uh, talk. Uh, subject to any questions or any questions. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for putting it together. Thank you. 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 Thank